my God, it's an honor and a privilege to podcast interview one of my mentors and idols for 30 years. I met this young man. Um, I think I was 29 and you were 21 or something. I was born in 62. How much older am I than you? I, I was born in 70. You were born in 70. I was yeah. born in 62. And for 30 years, I've been listening to you, your brother, your dad. I never, um, never got to meet your grandfather. He, he's the one who started it? Yes, he started in 1930, and I got to meet him, but he passed away when I was two. Oh, wow. Well, sorry about that. Do you have any memories of him? I don't. My brother does. Chuck, he passed away when my brother was uh, six, so my brother remembers him, but I don't. Yeah. He got I, it all started for us. He was a, he was a peddler, in, in, and he, had, he was given an opportunity at the Depression uh, by the Premier Dental Company to... Uh, to fill a satchel with dental instruments and take it on the train to Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. And he would go back and forth. Uh, you know, he'd come back when the satchel was empty. So he went door to door and peddled dental instruments. And that's how he got the whole thing started in uh, 1930. Wow. And um, not to make this about me, but that's how I got started going door to door too. When I opened up my dental office, I was open seven to seven, Monday through Friday. But Saturday morning, like today's Sunday, what is day, Monday morning? Saturday morning, I would get up and I would, and I had a map of Ahwatukee, the whole zip code. And I crossed off every street and went door to door and I'd knock on the door and I'd say, hey, I'm Howard. I just graduated from dental school. I'm right up at the corner by Safeway next to Chase Bank and Walgreens. And I'm gonna practice here for 40 years. Just wanted to get out and meet the neighborhood. And two out of three doors would look at me like, is that a dentist stalking on my door? You know, I'm 24. He looks like a baby and then I saw it was weird. But every third guy, he'd be standing there in his wife beater shirt and his underwear on his porch going, I got, I broke my hair. And I'd put down and put on my gloves and get out my flashlight and, and we'd talk about it. And then I would, my clothes was always, well, you know, I really need to have you come in and take an x-ray of that tooth. And then I pull out my little green notebook with a number two pencil and, uh, and, and and they'd say, well, do you have any openings? And I'd say, yeah, I have an opening uh, 12 hours a day, seven days a week till the end of time. Does any of that work for you? And I would not stop on Sunday until Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Every 90 minutes, I had a an exam that I met on their doorstop. And, you know, it's just all about hustling. And, and it's funny, um, talking to your dad, it seems like when I grew up, all those people who lived through the depression, you all knew who they were. It, it psychologically impacted them. And I'm already looking at this 2020. I mean, maybe we should talk about this for a minute before we start with your presentation, but um, this to me looks like a full blown depression. I mean, the, the stock market crashed in 29. Um, it took from 32 to 36, four years to lose about 25% of all the jobs. And we lost 25% of all the jobs in under 40 days. Um, this doesn't, um, does this look like it's gonna be a V where um, as soon as everybody opens their doors, it just bounces back open. I don't see any evidence of that versus a, a long U or a long L where it, it plummeted and it's gonna stay down because what I'm sensing is you're, gonna, you're opening back up all the dental offices, but we don't know if everyone's gonna come back. And, and, and um, what, what do you think? Um, you, you, you're seeing this industry from 30,000 feet. How, how, many, how many dental offices in the United States do you work with? We have about 20, 25,000 good customers, I would say. So, 20, um, so, so you have the data of 25,000. I mean, you're, you're like Mr. Statistic guy. You, know, you, you got your hands on both steering wheels. What percent of the market is going to come back? So unfortunately, that data is not going to really help us because it was all taken during the good times. I mean, the past decade, the past 20 years have been great for the economy. They've been great for dentistry. Um, I think in this case, um, <clears throat> I think we're going to have another, we're going to have 12 months that are challenging. I mean, there's no, there's, it's, it's hard to deny. I think um, there's a couple of things we have working against us. One is we've never practiced dentistry with 20% unemployment. So there's the, the macroeconomic effect. I think also there's a, there's a demographic that has uh, um, a lot of money. That's the 70 plus year old set. 
And I think many of them may not feel safe to go to the dentist until there's a vaccine. Hard to know how many will or won't be. And I think it depends a lot on what part of the country you're in. Um, so none of us have ever lived through this. And, um, but at the same time, there's huge pent up demand. No one's gone to the dentist in America in the past two months. So I think we're gonna get a nice spike in demand there. And also uh, I know that there's several organizations, big organizations that are lobbying the federal government to uh, work to make dentistry uh, safer, you know, and, and basically to help buy the equipment that needs to be bought. Um, and, um, and so I think we may get some federal government assistance. Uh, if you remember in the very beginning of this crisis, Donald Trump said, we can't have America without our airlines and therefore we're gonna earmark $50 billion to save our airlines. Similarly, a case can be made that dentistry is every bit or more important than our airlines. Imagine America without its dentists or dental industry. And as such, uh, it's not, if, if it's been done already for the airlines, 50 billion, why not do it for dentistry? So there's some organizations working on that. And so there's some good news that may be coming there too. But let's be honest. Um, so a lot of people say America, you know, has borrowed so much money, it'll never be able to repay its debt. And the minute they say that, you realize they don't have an MBA and they've never studied the Federal Reserve because America borrows from itself. And so we own the printing press. So we borrow from ourselves and we own the printing press. That's very different than, say, Argentina, um, where, you know, they have their peso, but it's pegged to the U.S. dollar. And, you know, very so uh, there, there's no technical way that America can default on its debt because it owns the counterfeiting printing press. The question is, what will those dollars be worth? And um, if you just, um, you know, it's like Gilligan's Island. If you and I are the only two people in the whole world and we live on Gilligan's Island, do you, who do you want to be? You want to be the skipper or... Uh, <laughs> um, um, I wish you were Marianne, but unfortunately, <laughs> I'm, I'm stuck on the island with the skipper. We'll, we'll, we'll call you the professor. And you, so if you're the professor and I'm Gilligan and, you know, I build uh, the, the huts while you go out and get fishing, that, that's the whole economy. But let's say you and I are on the island and the whole economy is you collected one coconut for the year and the government printed one dollar then total world productivity is one coconut valued at one dollar. If I'm the government and I just print another dollar, well, it didn't change the number of people. There's still me and you. We only produce one coconut. So now that dollar's worth two dollars. So whenever you print a bunch of money, um, you know, it's, it's inflationary. So we'll, we'll borrow a bunch of money, we'll pay it back. The question is, what will that dollar be worth if the, if the federal government just starts instead of adding $1 trillion a year of extra printed paper, starts adding two or three or four trillion. I mean, it's crazy. And then the other thing in dentistry that's starting to annoy me a little, you know, I've watched so many webinars and it's always a bunch of rich dentists from the rich 20 countries complaining, but the United Nations is saying that this, this closing down the airlines and the pandemic is going to create a starvation of biblical proportions in the underdeveloped world and the numbers that they're thinking of people who will literally start us. So like if all the dentists, you know, a lot of people are talking about, well, you know, we, we can't go back to work because then we're saying the economy is worth more than grandma. Well, forget the economy and grandma. Let's look at the planet. If you had two, if you had seven and a half billion people all go downstairs in the basement and hide for two years, they'd all starve to death. Every single per, I mean, we have, to, are, are you going to eat food today? Are you going to drink any water? Are you going to eat a sandwich? Are you going to have, I mean, we, we have to go on. And it, to me, it's kind of like, um, it kind of reminds me of Winston Churchill in Britain screaming, hey, you need to pay attention to these Germans. They're building a lot of tanks every week and no one wanted to hear it. And then when they, and then, then when he attacked Poland, people were like, well, you know, is, they, they still didn't want to believe it. So, and, and, and then when you have a response, yeah, people are going to die. This virus is going to kill a lot of people, but I, the, the, the world can't hide for two years. We have to come out of the basement and go back to work. And in dentistry, I thought that was our core competency, going back to HIV. I mean, we had to sell ourselves 40 years ago that you could get a filling done and not catch AIDS. And it was a challenge for a lot of Americans. I mean, my standing joke 
for the first five years I practiced, and it was always older ladies. It was always 70, 80-year-old grandmas that said, well, I'm concerned that I'm going to catch AIDS at the dental office. And I say, well, AIDS is a sexually transmitted disease, and I have you scheduled for a crown. Um, you know, and then they'd freak out. And then, and then I would open my drawer, and I'd pull out a condom, and I said, if you feel safer, if I wear this during the procedure, my rule is if you put it on me, I'll wear it during the entire procedure. And they'd all laugh and everything. But it was this serious challenge to make them believe. So here it is 32 years later, and I'm back to a challenge. And the reason I wanted to bring you on, because I, I don't know anybody in the world that would be a more expert. Not only do you sell PPE to 25,000 dentists in America, but you and I have both been to China. You, you've seen where these masks are made. And I don't even, and I don't, I'm having you to come on this, but I don't know what we're even talking about because the, the 95 mask says, it's gonna figure out, I'm sorry, my dog's freaking out. I gotta let him in. Mowgli, I'm in the middle of a podcast, you little brat. <laughs> Come here, Mowgli, say hi to Rick. Say hi to Rick. Come here. Here's Mowgli. Here's oh, Mowgli, can you that's say awesome. Rick? He's my, oh, he's, he's beautiful. Okay. No he, more. What is he, a boxer? <clears throat> I'm, I'm bad with dogs. That is that a boxer? A boxer, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, my life I'm probably some Irish mutt. Um, <laughs> but, but the thing is, um, it, it filters out 95%. So, so let's say that, let's say that, because you, you're going to talk about the, where these are made, what it means, and, and everybody's dying to know about this. There's like 10 threads on Dental Town about 95. But, but let's stop before you start. If it's a 95, that means 5% still getting through. And in virus, it's about viral load. You're still going to get an airborne um, by, uh, virus. But the, the, the people that are publishing, I love that paper yesterday I published on Dentaltown, where all those doctors in Toronto were saying, it's, it's not an aerosol disease, it's a droplet disease. And these guys, I'm going to read this. Um, um, Evidence shows COVID-19 is almost exclusively spread by droplets. Those challenges are underpinned by belief disease is airborne and that wearing N95 masks will reduce health worker risk when the evidence and science says other words. And this goes back to HIV, where it took them a long time to realize you need to get infected with about 100,000 of these viruses to get an infection. You know, cholera is about 100,000. And that this little one unit aerosol um, is not the issue. It's a droplet. It's I'm standing within six feet of you. I cough. And, and we've all done that our whole life where someone coughs or says something or laughs and your face gets sprayed. So, so, um, so I know, um, you know, is it aerosol disease? They, they got 20 epidemiologists in Canada to sign off on this deal that it's not an aerosol. Sure, and they're saying, yeah, technically, scientifically. And this goes back to the AIDS deal where people were saying back in the 80s, well, that, that man with AIDS, he went to the IHOP and he drunk off a glass, but then Rick, he just put it in the dishwasher. He didn't ought to clean it. He should have thrown it away and soaked it in bleach. And, and it's like, dude, that's not how it's transmitted. So these guys are saying that everyone in their hospital that has this infection was a person-to-person -person droplet. They see no evidence of a of a aerosol, like a hand speed, a high speed, a slow speed, creating this mist and drifting down from your neighbor's house. You know, there's all these theories that it's in the wind and the air, and there's like that. That's all probably theoretically true, but that's not what we're seeing in the real world. Well, so you may be right. Uh, I'm, I'm reading data just like you are every day. I'm not an epidemiologist or a virusologist. Um, I can tell you that I don't, I don't know any more than what I'm reading every day. Um, what I can tell you though, and what I think you and your readers will find very interesting, is how these PPE products get made, where they're made, why we don't have enough of them, and when it will all normalize what you need to use and why or how it works or how effective it is, I'm not the guy to tell you that. Um, but, you know, I think the CDC and ADA are really struggling with this one. Otherwise, we'd have more concrete recommendations by those two organizations. I think we can, but I mean, I believe that, that the ADA will 
have a concrete set of what we need to get started. Um, you know, they're, they're doing a nice job now, but they, they'll do an even more concrete ironclad job as the months roll on um, and clear up a lot of what's foggy. But that's not, I can't really, it doesn't matter what my opinions are with regard to what PPE to wear or what's most effective because I don't have a lab and that's not what I do. Okay, when you say ADA, are you talking about the Australian Dental Association or the Austrian Dental Association? There's so <laughs> many There's so many ADAs out there, I can't even, there's 208 countries and way too many of them start with A. So, um, so are you gonna go full screen with your presentation? I'm gonna go full screen and if, uh, and I can get started right now. Slides. Uh, we're going to talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly truths of our worldwide PPE supply chain. First, quickly a disclaimer. Uh, the information I'm about to share represents my impressions based on industry knowledge and not research of any governmental or health-based agency rules or regulations. In a fast-changing environment, we urge practitioners to check with other professional advisors as they restart their practices. Um, it says April 30th, but today is uh, the 13th of May. Uh, today we'll talk about uh, notes on face mask authenticity, worldwide supply chain complexities, including gloves, face masks, clothing, and all other PPE. Um, I'll talk about my thoughts on PPE price increases and what's going on in the marketplace. And we'll talk about uh, notes on China and worldwide partners. And finally, when and how does our PPE supply chain normalize? Okay, so first, the, the CDC has uh, released a, uh, uh, some guidance on how to know that your respirator, and this is just related to KN95s and N95s are counterfeit. So uh, as a review, the KN95 is the Chinese standard and the N95 is the US standard. And so many of the respirators coming from China are found to be counterfeit. Um, so we do a lot of regulatory checking on anything uh, that we sell, but uh, for your guidance, uh, look to the CDC website. Um, one quick and easy thing, you will see N95s with ear loops. Um, just very quickly, uh, in the event that you see an N95 with ear loops, you know immediately it's counterfeit. Ear loops are not part of the N95 standard. Ear loops are allowable for KN95s but not for N95. So one quick and easy way, if you do see an N95 with ear loops, you know it's counterfeit. But more information there on the CDC website. Um, here's an example of an N95 with ear loops. It's not, uh, it's not real. Someone, someone sent that to us to resell. We, we uh, declined. Uh, Wall Street Journal on May 4th uh, wrote an article that you've probably seen, but it talks about how uh, 60% of, uh, of, the, of the Chinese respirators that are coming that are KN95s did not pass muster according to the, uh, the FDA tests, real problem. Um, and they uh, noted that some of them that are supposed to be filtering out 95% of tiny particles are only filtering out 35% and in some cases 15% so this is not um, that the respirator is performing 5% less than advertised, but uh, performing instead at uh, significantly worse. So there's real issues with some masks out there today, as we all know. Um, some of the ways, just very briefly, on what we do at Benco to validate face masks, um, and you can try this at home, but it uh, we've got a regulatory department and. Uh, you know, a great guy leading it who is an expert at this. So um, the uh, one thing he does, he ver verifies the FDA registration. Um, many masks that we're finding from China were just registered uh, since uh, March of 2020. So they just, just got into the game. That's a red flag. Uh, we identify fake certificates at the uh, my regulatory guy tells me that uh, the FDA does not issue certificates, so uh, it is kind of, uh, we do get a lot of people sending us FDA certificates with an eagle on the top looking like it's an official American document. Um, to my knowledge, the FDA doesn't, uh, doesn't issue certificates, so that's another red flag. 
Um, is the factory FDA registered for face masks? We're finding that uh, lots of uh, mattress cover companies are in the face mask business all of a sudden, and uh, glassware companies or whatever uh, they were registered for before, uh, they, um, they're not, they weren't registered for face masks. And then finally, what, what separates, as they say, the girls from the women or the men from the boys is, uh, is their FDA device listing number. And that's a secret number that the FDA gives a factory when they do grant it. So you can't make it up. And then once we get that number from the factory in Asia, we can go to the FDA uh, office at, or website and cross-reference it so we know it's authentic. We do these four things uh, and many more to validate face masks. Most face masks these days from China uh, don't pass muster. Um, and so uh, it's, you know, again, I don't recommend you do it at, do this at home. I do recommend you do buy from a trusted source. Uh, and when I say trusted source, you should buy from a company that has a regulatory department that's watching these things. And many dental suppliers don't. Uh, uh, this slide I just put in because I thought it was interesting. Um, this was sent to us uh, and had some poetry on the side. Uh, Breathe freely and bring forest into home. And you just kind of can picture what happened. Someone at the factory must have said, does anyone here speak English? And so uh, someone must have raised their hand and said, we need you know, uh, something to put on the side of the box. And, and it was he or she uh, uh, said, breathe freely and bring forest into home. I guess to them, uh, the forest is the clean place, you know, the place where the clean air is. So that's how that made it to this box, probably. That doesn't tell you at all whether or not this is an authentic KN95 or whether it filters air. It just means it's creative packaging. And uh, But I did find it to be uh, fun, so I put it in the slideshow for you all. Okay, I'm going to skip to gloves now. Uh, new topic. Um, so uh, I want to take you inside of a glove factory. Gloves are mostly made in Malaysia. Thailand and Indonesia these days. Uh, if you're thinking that Malaysia is a tropical island with palm trees and uh, uh, you know hammocks, uh, you're right. There's parts of Malaysia like that, but they also know how to build a great glove factory. Here is a picture of one of them, one of the more modern ones. And just to give you some perspective, that's a tractor trailer. So these factories are massive and uh, very well equipped, very automated, and they do a great job. Uh, this is the inside of one. Uh, many factories don't let you take pictures, uh, but uh, these are, you can see the ceramic molds that, that whip through these factories and dip into a solution that then um, makes the gloves. Um, this is kind of cool. Uh, many of you may not have realized that in many factories, not all, but in many factories, the gloves are still stripped by hand and usually by uh, Nepalese or Bangladeshi labor that um, moves to Malaysia temporarily to help out. Um, these jobs are hot, uh, they're long hours, and uh, I think it's about 100 degrees usually where, where these men are working. They're almost always men who are stripping gloves. And, um, uh, uh, but but it, I'm sure it's coming as a surprise to many of you that it's mainly done by hand these days. Not, not in all cases, but in many. And it also will be surprising that they're counted and boxed by hand. Again, usually by Nepalese and Bangladeshi labor. So here's a photo of a factory that's counting gloves and boxing gloves and uh, uh, still done by hand in most factories. Okay. I just talked briefly about gloves. Uh, I don't think gloves will be a terrible problem for dentistry. Um, most factories, the good ones, are telling us that uh, they'll keep our uh, allocations the same as they were pre-COVID. Um, it's not the case in all cases, but we're fingers crossed. We should have a good solid allocation of gloves uh, through this crisis until the um, the additional supply can be created. Worldwide supply for gloves is up about 2X. So twice what it used to be, uh, and the factories are struggling to keep up and build new capacity. But I don't think the gloves are gonna be a problem for dentistry. We always bought gloves, and I think that mostly 
uh, our sources will take good care of us through this pandemic. I don't see it as a as a major problem. Uh, face masks. We're going to shift quickly to face masks. Just to uh, quick start with a photograph. Um, there is a way to make a flat ear loop uh, a little safer. And this is a, uh, I would call this a hack that was uh, designed by one of our associate spouses. And you can see two squares there. One is a knot in the ear loop, uh, which tightens the mask against your face. And the other is this great looking headband with buttons. There's a button on either side. And uh, that takes a lot of the ear strain away. So it's more comfortable to wear masks for a long period of time, especially uh, since this hack will put additional strain on your ears. So I uh, would recommend if you're using any flat ear loop, whether it's level one, two, or three, that you put a little knot on either side and then uh, consider a headband. They're easily made and um, uh, I think you'll find it to be a much more comfortable day. Okay, on to face masks. I always start with raw materials. Every factory has raw materials. Uh, don't forget that Prior to uh, this, whoever's making these rolls, they also have raw material factories. So before we get a product, there's been a chain of factories involved that involve raw materials to raw materials to raw materials to finished goods. Anyway, uh, these are rolls of a product called non-woven and filter media. Those are the two main ingredients to masks. And here is a photo of a woman who is putting ear loops on masks by hand. Uh, it's probably a surprise to many of you that those ear loops don't go on with a machine. In many factories, they are put on by machine and that's changing. But still, I think in probably more than 50% of mask factories in Asia, uh, the ear loops are still put on by hand. They're put on very quickly. Uh, these women work extremely rapidly and uh, they do a great job for us. Um, and then, and that's do that is shifting in the U.S. Uh, they're all put on by machine. So um, I don't have any pictures of any U.S. factories. Not be, uh, we do a lot of business with U.S. mass factories, but they don't let me take pictures. So uh, so anyway, these are uh, this is how it's done in many factories in China. Not all. Here's a table of women working, putting on ear loops, working very hard. Uh, many of them are working 12-hour days, um, and uh, uh, they are really the unsung heroes of this whole pandemic. They're working uh, hard so that all of us can have the PPE that we need. Uh, again, ear loops. And here's packing. Uh, many of you have opened uh, boxes from Amazon or wherever you're getting your stuff and never thought about how this stuff is placed in the cardboard, the brown cardboard box. Uh, in almost all cases, it's done by hand. And uh, here is a, a, a cone mask factory where the men are putting the, the cone masks into boxes by hand. Here's inspection of a cone mask factory. And here is a flat ear loop factory and the machine that makes the flat ear loops. And if you look to the lower right, you'll see the pleats being put in by machine. Okay. Let's talk about ear loop, about face masks. Again, two types of face masks. There's the KN95 and the N95, uh, and then there's the flat ear loop, which is level one and level two and level three. The main difference is that the KN95 and the N95 fit your face without much leakage. The air is much more filtered, and that's optimal in an airborne, when, when we have an airborne disease problem. So. If you can get KN95s and N95s, which are extremely hard to get, that's your best option, as long as the KN95 and the N95 are authentic and have passed their certifications. We talked about this a couple of minutes ago. On the flat ear loop side, uh, what we've always bought about 70% of our flat ear loops from America. Uh, again, most of those factories are fully automated. Um, so, uh, but the, still, China is making 70% of the world's flat ear loop masks. So like it or not, um, we are stuck with that situation until more mask capacity can move back to the U.S. I do think it will. Reason being, you can make masks by machine. 
And, um, and so the main mask factories in the, in the U.S., and there's four or five big ones, are struggling to keep up with U.S. demand of flat ear loop face masks. So I do think that face masks will come back to the U.S., but I also think it'll take at least a year until those machines can be built and the investment can be made. But I think that face masks will come to the U.S. In the meantime, we're dependent upon China. Um, China has let us down, uh, meaning uh, the pricing we're finding is going up 20 to 30x, uh, not 20 to 30 percent more, but 20 to 30 times more. So we are experiencing that in China. I'll explain why uh, in a couple of minutes, but uh, it's a real problem for us. Um, and as a result, uh, I believe that this capacity will move to the U.S. You know, at, at Benco, we've been buying most of our masks from U.S. for a long time, uh, and that's been that'll be great for us, you know, going forward because we are entitled to the capacity post COVID. COVID. So. Um, so anyway, that, those are some notes on face masks. I'll talk more about face masks and pricing in a couple of minutes. Clothing, disposable clothing, lab jackets, lab coats. Uh, let's take you into a clothing factory briefly. Uh, again, we start with raw materials. These are uh, big spools of a product called non-woven, which is a product in very high demand. That's, what, that's the main ingredient to uh, lab coats and lab jackets. It may surprise you, they're all sewn by hand, all in China, and uh, they're made by very skilled workers that work at an unbelievably rapid pace. Um, they're paid piecework, and, uh, and they're very skilled at what they do. Starts with patterns. So if you've ever been in a dress factory or any factory with clothing, you know that there's patterns. Those patterns are used to cut the material, the raw material. And here's another mask factory. In the upper right hand corner, you'll see uh, that the cuffs have been sewn on that uh, that work in progress over there and all throughout you see a lot of sewing going on. If I had audio or video, you'd see how quickly they work and how loud it is in those factories. Here's a woman that uh, I didn't get a sense she has her she's had her picture taken before or anyone has ever taken interest in any of the, in the work that she's done. But uh, I think that that was the reason for the smile. Um, but, uh, you know, I, in, in many ways, you know, she and, and all of her coworkers are the unsung heroes here uh, for all of our PPE. They work very, very hard. Um, and uh, and, and th they're struggling to keep up. Now, your question is probably when does the disposable clothing business come back to the U.S. where it needs to be? The answer is I don't think ever. Uh, Americans, um, we don't have a lot of sewing skills in the U.S. anymore. Um, and if these disposable clothing items were made in the U.S., I think they'd be 10 to 20 times more expensive. So uh, it's unlikely that the disposable clothing business will come back to the U.S. Never was in the U.S., but uh, unlikely that that's going to happen. That business will stay in China. Uh, now. What we're finding for disposable clothing is tremendous shortages. And uh, first and foremost, the raw material that is made, that, that, that this clothing is made of, is called non-woven, where uh, the factories are complaining that the raw material factories are raising the prices four to five times what is normal. Uh, the factories are having a lot of trouble getting their sewers back to work. So these factories at best are working at 80% capacity. And, uh, and at the same time, there's a probably five or six X, five or six times the demand of normal for disposable clothing. So when will China catch up to the demand? It's hard to know if it'll happen within the next 12 or 18 months. They need a lot more skilled labor and uh, they need a, a larger supply of non-woven. And um, it's a real problem and no one knows when it'll, it'll normalize. At Benco, we recommend that you make a partnership with your local uniform uh, launderer. These are companies that take care of the restaurants in your area and they will provide, you know, six changes of clothing per person in the office for something very low price, like $6 a week or something. 
they deliver it, they pick it up, they launder it, they provide a, a very valuable service. And uh, we recommend that you look into that uh, because there's going to be some real disposable clothing shortages and price increases coming, uh, coming our way in dentistry. Okay, uh, let's talk about the PPE price increases that are about to hit. Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned to you, Anytime there's a finished product, there's usually five or six raw material factories behind it. And then there's raw material factories before them. So think of it like a chain, links in a chain, where the final link is uh, the distributor that you're buying from. But all along the chain, there are various, there have been in, in this crisis, various price increases. There have been two types. One is legitimate price increases, and that is, a price increase that happens when the workers demand twice the pay to come back to work in a COVID environment. That's legitimate. Another legitimate price increase is if your raw material manufacturers are raising the price for the raw materials. For example, the middle layer of a mask, which is also known as filter media uh, or, or melt blown, we're hearing reports that there's an 80x price increase on filter media not 80%, but 80 times what's normal. To a mask factory, that's a legitimate price increase. They have to take the price of their raw materials and, and use that to compute their price to us. All along the chain though, there are also examples of illegitimate price increases, otherwise known as price gouging. Unfortunately, in a pandemic, the last link in the chain happens to be the one that typically gets the blame for all of the price gouging and legitimate price increases that took place beforehand. I can tell you at Benco, there is absolutely no price gouging going on. Our margins are lower on PPE, and in some cases significantly lower than they've ever been. As our costs go up, we're raising our prices in a slower uh, amount. So. Therefore, at least at Benco, and I think at most American legitimate distributors, there's no price gouging going on. These price increases are legitimate. However, keep in mind, we're seeing increases in price of 20 to 30X on key products like face masks. Now, when we talk to the face mask manufacturers, they say, what can we do? Our raw materials have gone up 80X. So um, it is. It does multiply along the chain. Each link multiplies, and what we're going to see in many categories of PPE is very high price increases. Rest assured, at Benco, all of the price increases you see are legitimate. We can't buy masks for $30 a box and then sell them to you for $5 a box or $7 a box like we used to. We have to take our incoming costs, add a small markup, and then that's how we compute our price to you. So and I think we're going to be shocked at some of the price increases that we're going to see on face masks, disposable clothing, and some other PPE. Okay, uh, notes on China and worldwide partners. So uh, China is getting a lot of bad press these days uh, with regard to PPE. Um, some of it's deserved, uh, some of it's not. So uh, as with any country, um, you know, just like there's bad people in America, there's bad people in China. Um, and for every bad person, there's a thousand good people. Um, some of the photos I showed you showed, showed some of the hardworking uh, Chinese people that are really the unsung heroes of the PPE crisis that we're facing. Um, there are some people that are uh, really messing up everything in uh, regards to some price gouging that's going on. There's price gouging going on in the U.S., but uh, we believe it's to a much lesser extent. Um, for the most part, uh, the factories that we work with, we believe are handling things honorably. Um, we're hearing that labor, there's a huge labor shortage there. Um, we're hearing that, uh, of course, China is a one child, has a one child uh, set of laws for years. And uh, there's moms and dads that don't want their kids to go back to work during the times of COVID. Um, so there's issues there. Uh, many factories are operating at 70, 80%. And worldwide demand for a lot of these products is up 5, 6x. So it's a real problem. Um, many of these PPE items are coming back to the United States. One, 
and, and those that will come back are the ones that are able to be made through automation. Face masks are the big one. So um, uh, face masks can be made by machines, fully automated. Um, as I mentioned to you before, 70% of the face masks we, Benko was buying were American-made face masks. Um, I believe all of that will come to the United States. It will take time to build those machines and build that capacity. There are PPE products that are gonna stay in China. For example, disposable clothing. Uh, you need a low cost labor force to make disposable clothing um, in the quantities that are needed by the world. And that will likely not come to America until someone finds a way to do it uh, through machine. Um, there are, um, and I'll skip to the next topic, which is when and how does our supply chain normalize? In some categories, it has already organized. And uh, one of my favorite examples is just plain old, uh, good old fashioned uh, American ingenuity. Um, I think I have an example here. Uh, there was a shortage of hand sanitizer. You might've forgotten, but three, four weeks ago, no one could get any of it. And uh, then the liquor factories all figured out a way uh, to change their factories into hand sanitizer factories. So in li as little as two or three weeks, the hand sanitizer problem in America was resolved completely through good old fashioned uh, American innovation. I love it. Um, secondly, face shields. We're finding that that was a huge problem. Uh, and now uh, there's been lots of American plexiglass factories that have retooled and are now face, mask, uh, face shield factories. So a lot more face shields are being made in the US. Face mask factories are all making huge investments in the United States right now. And I think there's gonna be huge capacity coming online uh, by the fall. Um, so those products will come to the US. As I mentioned, disposable clothing never will. Um, and, um, and so for that, we just have fingers crossed. And in the meantime, we would recommend that uh, for disposable clothing that you find a clothing launderer. Um, we don't think there's going to be a problem with gloves. Gloves are a very automated uh, process. Uh, the Southeast Asians have it uh, pretty well covered. Um, I think they will continue to take care of, be able to take care of dentistry um, going forward. So I don't anticipate a huge problem with gloves. Overall, um, I am very concerned about uh, the PPE shortages that are coming our way. I'm very concerned about the PPE price increases in certain categories, especially face masks and disposable clothing. These price increases are beyond our control. We're doing the best we can, literally working day and night, sourcing product wherever we can to make sure that product is safe. And uh, we're finding that in order to get the product we need, we're paying significant multiples of what we used to have to pay, in some cases, 20 to 30 times. So that being said, that's the end of my prepared notes. And uh, uh, I'm not on Twitter, no. Yeah, you're I'm not, not really Twitter. into social media. So you're what? I'm not that into social media. I don't do it. Um, and, and I want to go back to the, the China remarks, because um, I, 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 I really am hoping that this pandemic get pulls the whole world together because it, it's it's us sapiens and i don't like to call us homo sapiens because you've killed all the other homos i mean you killed homo neanderthal homo denosovan homo habilis homo erectus every every other homo is missing along with a bunch of large animals that we like to eat so um so we we have a very i mean you don't get to be the apex creature of earth without being a long successful killer along the way and we need to folk, we need to stay together and focus on killing viruses and exploding stars. And you know, we, we we've had six mass extinction level events, and the only and everything that seemed to survive those were underground, like the mice we came from. So I don't know why we're building buildings above the ground when we should be building them below the ground. And I don't know why humans are fighting each other when we need to spend all of our resources fighting viruses. Um, which was the self-replicating mechanism that got us from chemistry into the biosphere. And I hope this pulls together. And I have lectured in China several times, and I have always found them to be the nicest, sweetest, loving, caring. And, and, um, and as far as politics, 
I, all the countries, people don't like their politics. I mean, I don't care if you go to, I don't care what country you go to. I mean, if you, have you ever gotten drunk on vodka in Moscow? There weren't, there aren't many dentists praising, you know, the, the government. I, I, I think the only thing the universe can agree on is that we're all embarrassed of our governments. I mean, and, and which means that they all have to keep raising the bar. And I think they've been raising the bar for a thousand years. And this American exceptionalism um, didn't really work out well for the coronavirus. And um, we're, we're going to have to live through that. Um, but on these, on these 95 face masks, we don't know. I'm not a virologist. Um, um, I'm not an epidemiologist, but it seems like everybody that is qualified is saying that we have a nasal, we have a droplet issue, not an aerosol issue and um, just get those masks on tight. But I want to, I want to switch gears completely. Do you got a little more extra time? Sure. Yeah. Um, you, um, something um, that you're also, um, so, so you're, you and your brother manage uh, Benco, a 90-year-old company, but you also have a, another company, Clarion Financial. Yeah. Um, is, that, is that giving you any data or are, are dentists financially stressed or when they're calling Clarion Financial, are they more likely not to qualify because they don't have, you know, you don't have data? Like, like I've noticed this in Arizona. Arizona is ground zero for DSOs, 18% of all the dentists were in DSOs because our governor, I love him, um, where he um, said, if you're licensed to be a registered nurse or an accountant in any other state, you're licensed in Arizona. We're, we're going to, we, you know, you need fluid markets. Pe um, people need to, um, I, I know woman dentist that was married to a man businessman and he got transferred. They have to sell their practice and go to another state. And she was, she was in my house crying, not because she had to sell her practice and move, but because she had to go through boards and this and all, all this friction. So Arizona is a very frictionless economy. And the DSOs are saying, um, we're not going to sign the dotted line on buying your practice now. We were going to before the pandemic, but now that we had this pandemic, we want to see two months open business. We want to see what this looks like after two months. And you're in Clarion Financial. What what are you seeing? How is how is uh, Benco's financial arm to the dentist? How has that changed um, pre pandemic and post pandemic? So it's it's actually a very interesting question. So um, we you know we have these machines that are called ADS. They're um, suction units that are freestanding, and there's a pipe that goes near the patient's mouth and sucks up all the aerosol, and so. Uh, they're very hot items. We sold, they just were announced two months ago. I think we sold two or 3,000 of them. Each one is about $3,000. And so, um, what's the name of the machine? ADS. Uh, but there's several of them now. That happens to be a good one, we think. Everything's moving so quickly. So it's um, called ADS Oral Suction? ADS. I don't know what the second part of it is called, but it's, but it's, but it's ADS three grand. Company. It's about three grand. So, um, it happens that mo many of those who bought that machine from us financed it through Clarion. And so it's only a $3,000. I shouldn't say only because, you know, dentists are, no secret, dentists are hurting right now. There's not cash flow coming in. And so a lot of dentists opted to finance this $3,000 item. Whereas in the past, many dentists would have simply written a check. These days they're financing it. What I will say, which is really kind of cool, is that we will finance an additional 25% of whatever your equipment purchase is in the form of supplies. So say, that, say that again. So if you buy a $3,000 piece of equipment from us and you finance it through Clarion, we'll, we'll give you about a $1,000 credit to supplies, which you can add to that financing contract. So it becomes a $4,000 uh, contract, and then you get $1,000 to buy supplies that you need. So if cash flow is tight, and if you qualify, um, you can buy hard equipment, and then 25% of that, you can buy consumables, PPE, whatever you need. So there's lots of dentists that, um, that are utilizing financing now more than they used to before. Okay, so um, I'm uh, posting that on Dental Town. So Rick says, if you buy the $3,000 ADS and finance it through um, www.clarion. 
It's clarionfinancial.com or clarifin.com. Clarifin, I think, will take you there. I'm pretty sure. C L A R dot com. Um, you will get one thousand dollars of free supplies. It works out to be something like that. And if you spend a hundred thousand on equipment, if you buy a Solea laser, you can you can get twenty five thousand additional of supplies. And so then that hundred thousand dollar contract becomes a hundred and twenty five thousand dollar contract. But you can spend that twenty five thousand on consumables at Benco. So up to 25%. It's really cool. And, uh, and then you could take seven year, five years to pay it back. Wow. Uh, for, for you said if you buy $100,000 for a laser, which one did you say? I mentioned Solea, but it, basically any equipment purchase, we will give you 25% additional with which you can buy consumables. Okay. Uh, it goes on your contract. You pay it off over time. But it's a really easy way to get, I shouldn't say easy, that's the wrong word, nothing is easy. But you are, you're, you're signing your name on a contract that you're gonna pay it back, but uh, you can take any equipment purchase, whatever the value is, add 25% to it and get that amount in supplies. Okay, I just, I just posted that on the thread for ADS and I, I, and I sent it to you just to make sure that awesome. you can see it. Also, I mean, just uh, first thing I'm thinking, so if I buy this $3,000 suction ADS and I'm wearing the Benco 95 mask, then I cannot smell my assistant's farts. Is that, is that obvious? I love dentistry uncensored. Uh, I mean, my God, I, I'm gonna pay $3,000 and a $3 mask and still have to smell that. I have never been asked that question, and I, uh, I've never tested it, but uh, there's probably a way to test it. So you'll get back to me? You'll get back, get back to me? You'll get back to that? Um, so, um, gosh, so many. Um, so, so, again, uh, about the, um, the also the backlash, because I, I'm, I'm sensitive to China because it, it, it's just tribalism. I mean, I, mean, I can't believe, I, I've lectured in 50 countries, and so many of the countries that the United States is hostile with, <laughs> It's just, it's just insane. And, and every, everybody wants to blame everything on another country. You gotta remember that, yeah, somebody in China, um, th this probably came from a bat in China. It wasn't from someone eating a bat. Every epidemiologist says it probably went from a bat to another animal first and then into a human. It didn't go straight bat. But the, the big one came from where I grew up in Kansas. It was a guy eating a pig, a pig, the zoonotic transfer for the Spanish influenza happened in Kansas to a farmer who was then drafted to Leavenworth and all the breakouts and everybody knows it started with Kansas. And everybody says the next one, the, the big bad one would actually come from a US poultry farm where you have a million chickens growing in one little laboratory deal. So for America, to um, everybody always likes to blame everything for someone else. And I'm lucky because I can blame everything I've ever done wrong on my mother. She's 82. I still um, talk to her daily and still blame her for everything. And she just, uh, she laughs and thinks it's all funny. Uh, but um, it will be, these are interesting times. Um, I still think it's a droplet issue and I still don't think it's an aerosol issue, but I think we have to do the aerosol. I think we have to filter the air and have these big suctions and do all that because perception equals reality. And I think when these people come back, it, it's, I'm, I'm very nervous for a couple of reasons. This virus is killing um, the elderly far more than the young. I mean, do we agree on that? Yeah. That, that, that the under 20 casualties is not even a percent. That's why I take a deep breath of relief for Africa because their median age is only 19 and a half. So half that country is, is not even 20. And whereas the United States, Whereas the United States, the halfway mark is 39. So hopefully, hopefully, uh, I, I'm not worried about the virus in, in these young people, poor countries. I'm, I'm worried about their business has been interrupted and they were used to working all day for cash to go to the market to buy food to eat that day. And the, um, with all the shipping and everything stopped, the United Nations is, is screaming and yelling, we're going to see mass starvations of biblical proportions. So, so if you're, um, 
So if you're sitting at home thinking that rich dentists can hide in the basement for two years um, because you're worried that 1% or 2% of the elderly with several pre-existing conditions, many of which in Italy, um, you know, were, you know, in, in, their, in their final decade for sure, and many were in their final year for sure, you do have to balance that with starvations of biblical proportions. Mm. And you own, uh, your um, Benco has uh, um, the finance company. I mean, you know more than ever, dentists and a government printing money, we, we can't sit home for two years. Right. That, that, that's, that's not an option. Well, it's, it's not an option for dentists, but it's really not an option for Americans. Americans need dental care. There's no, there's no other way to say it. I mean, you know it. You, what would your patients do if they didn't have anywhere to go for two years? Well, I'm lucky because since this pandemic broke out, all of my patients stopped drinking Coke, Mountain Dew, Twinkies, Oreos. They're home only eating carrots and celery and bottled right. water. And, um, and they're swishing with Listerine three times a day for a minute. So I'm not worried, but I'm in Arizona, you know, the Florida of the West. I'm <laughs> sure it's very different where you live. By, by the way, where you live, I got it. For you international viewers, he lives in Pennsylvania. And the minute you say Benko, I only have one thought. There's more deer walking around your company store. I mean, I've never visited you without seeing half a dozen deer. I mean, it's like it's like your deer is everyone else's squirrels. Um, <laughs> I mean, right? We have a lot of deer, except for not after the first day of hunting season. So there's Oh. Hunting season does start and really takes uh, cuts down the population of deer. So, but you must have been here a week before hunting season. Oh my gosh! I mean, it's just—I thought I was at a deer petting zoo, and <laughs> I, you know, I really did. I mean, it's—it's it's really freakish if you're not from around there. You know, uh, the funny but, thing is, this is worth saying. The funny thing is, in New Jersey, they also have a lot of deer, but since there's no hunting in New Jersey, they're not afraid of humans. In Pennsylvania, it's amazing. It's, it's almost like they know they're in Pennsylvania and they know that humans, you know, that humans have guns. And so they run away from you in Pennsylvania, but in New Jersey, they're not afraid at all. Um, you know what I would like to get from you is, um, have, have your, you have an amazing mind. Have you made a succinct list of um, BC to AC before Corona, after Corona? I mean, because where I'm going with this is that when I got out of school, and again, you can't make this stuff up, but when I got to Arizona, the oldest, most adorable dentist in Scottsdale, the Scottsdale Study Club, he, his customer was his ashtray. And he was still no gloves and smoking. And he had the richest clientele because it was all North Scottsdale, 80-year-old multi-gazillionaire widows who still chain smoked. And it was the only dental office where you could go and still chain smoke with the dentist um, but because of HIV, um, the young ones like me wore the gloves, wore the mask. Um, you put a lot of down. I wanted the cuspidors because that's all I knew. But over the years, every you, you and your brother were always arguing. You know, we, we finally got rid of all those. Um, we had the um, the water coming in from the street for a high speed. And when I was flunking colony formation units tests. Um, we tried various different things, but the easy solution was just go to bottled water in the room. Um, some people are saying that the office-wide suction is dead and that it's going to go to individual office suction units um, like this um, ADF. Um, it's okay. He's a dog lover. He can uh, Actually, that wasn't the dog. That was, that was my wife. That was, uh, <laughs> she sounds just like a boxer. Um, but um, some pe some people are saying that the end of the, the office wide suction is dead and it'll go to a unit, and some people, and some people are saying that um, doors are going to have to go on all the office and negative pressure rooms. But do you have a succinct BC AC list of what is not going to be the same? So and can, uh, and can I have that list? In fact, if you write the article, I could just erase. Rick Cohen and put on Howard Fran and be my next month's call. <laughs> well, first of all, I think my brother's an expert in that. And I think, um, I think he's got a lot to say about that. What I'll say is I'll give you my opinion, but I would say that his, is a, his thoughts are a lot more developed than mine. It's one of the things he really focuses on. 
But um, first of all, I think we're going to see a need for stronger central suctions because I think the central suction is going to become the main uh, way to get aerosols out of the patient's mouth. I think there's going to be tubes connected to the uh, basement suction. So that's part A. Part B is I think we're going to, in new offices, we're going to get away from the open concept. I think in, there may be ways to retrofit old offices. We're still working on a number of things. Uh, we have experts doing a lot of thinking about that right now, including my brother. Um, and so I do think that the AC, as you say, uh, will be different, but um, I think in many ways it'll be better, it'll be safer. And uh, you know, my hope is that we get a little government assistance to, to make it happen, so. Well, if you're gonna hope for that, why not just a, a unicorn to come by and hand you a Bud Light? <laughs> well, it did happen to the airline. So let's uh, oh gosh, imagine gosh. America without its, without its dentists. It's just un, unthinkable. And so if we need help, I'm hoping that, uh, that perhaps our government might, uh, uh, might be able to help us out. Um, because he, here's the bottom line. Um, the dentists, their revenues are down. And if, you're, if the average dental office had 65, two-thirds overhead, um, a third, it was a third margin. So if you're down a third, you probably lost your margin. And, um, and then when we open this thing back up, if you only get back to 50% of revenue, you, you're going to be profit challenged unless you aggressively cut cost. And so when these dentists are looking at making a negative air pressure room, getting a $3,000 suction, they're getting so much crazy information. And I would just like to keep the chain of command between you and Benko and me, you know, you, you, Chuck and me, because if they go listen to the government, I mean, I'm here in Arizona, the Governor Ducey says one thing, the State Board says another, the Centers for Disease Control says another, the World Health Organization says another, the White House says another. I mean, so the dentists are getting pulled by 20 different directions. So I can tell them, Dennis, keep one eye on your State Board of Dental Examiners and the other eye on your peers on Dental Town. Because at the end of the day, all religion teaches you to treat other people like you want to be treated. And what I don't understand about the emergency dental care, I mean, I've worked in an emergency room. Uh, at Creighton University, as my student, um, you got 15 hours at minimum wage. And my job was in, in uh, St. Joseph's emergency room. Well, what is the definition of an emergency, Rick? I mean, I mean, there's people out there because they got a sniffle. There's someone out there. I, I, I actually saw a person in the emergency room who had a Pepsi, a Coca-Cola bottle stuck in his rectum. I mean, is that on the CDC list? I mean, the CDC, so you forget all the list. I'm a doctor, you're a patient. And my first patient we opened back up was a 71 year old lady who lost her front tooth the day before we closed on St. Patrick's Day. Do you know how livid this 71 year old lady was that she didn't have a front tooth from St. Patrick's Day to Cinco de Mayo. And if Governor Ducey would have stood in that room and told her it's not an emergency to go home, I would have bet money on the 71 year old. I mean, she was so crazy mad and I'm a doctor and I've been practicing with universal precautions for 32 years. I'm not gonna catch AIDS from that 71 year old lady because I don't think she was kind of that kind of a lady. Um, but I, um, um, I, I'm, you know, I'm not going to catch COVID if I follow these universal precautions. Right. Well, here's the thing. We're working on our thinking. Um, we've got a lot of great experts working on it, um, including the person that leads our design department came from the hospital business. So she knows a ton about um, aseptic uh, uh, healthcare environments. That said, um, who's really going to set the tempo for this dance is the CDC and the ADA. So do take our recommendations, but take them with a grain of salt because they do change. And at the end of the day, the ADA and the CDC will come out with recommendations that we're all going to need to live by. But the CDC, just for our international viewers and all the kids in dental kindergarten school, is not a regulatory agency. They don't have any teeth. It's just... It's just an agency that just- It's an agency, but the way our uh, lawyer happy world works is that you have to do, I think we'll find that dentists will have to follow the CDC guidelines or else if there's a problem, 
they'll be sued and you won't like the outcome if you're not following the CDC guidelines. If you're following CDC guidelines and you get sued, you're gonna come out okay. If you don't follow them, it's gonna be bad. So I do think the CDC recommendations are quite important. But having, I'm not a lawyer, but I am smarter than all of them combined. <laughs> um, they all, I mean, you gotta follow the money. What they always do when they're gonna sue a dentist, they try to get a judgment first against you from your local state board. And then they start moving in with, with the, the trial and all that kind of stuff. So, so um, you gotta keep one eye on your state board. And you know, you're, so if your state board says do this, that, that, that you, you, gotta, you gotta realize that. So I, I keep one eye on your, your state board of dental examiners and one eye on the CDC and um, the ADA is doing all they can. And by, by the way, um, all the complaining about the ADA, it's about 25% of the dentists on Dental Town are all complaining about the ADA and three quarters um, or think they're doing a great job. And having five sisters and a brother, I could say that's about the same feedback that they all gave my parents. I mean, you know, I mean, it's like, come on. And I always tell my sisters, I said, well, when's the last time you raised seven kids? You know, give, give my old man a break. And uh, so um, um, they're, they're your parents, they're the only ones you got. But this is not the time when the Titanic slams into a iceberg, it's not the time um, to sit there and throw your parents overboard. You're, you're gonna need the ADA, um, listen to the CDC, but I know how these lawyers think. And every time you run a lawsuit by them with a dentist, the first thing they say is, well, did you get a judgment against by, by the board? I mean, cause they'll, they'll get the records and you know, if, if they can go in there and say, oh, Chuck or Rick or Larry, you, you messed up, that that's, makes them go forward. So, um, uh, so keep one eye on your local state board, keep one eye on CDC. And uh, if you don't like um, the ADA, I bet your mom doesn't even like you. And uh, that's, 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 what I, that's what I tell them. I said, well, I know your mom doesn't like you any more than you like the ADA because you're being toxic. So, hey, um, so if your uh, brother can send me anything before I do my editorial at two, or if he wants to come on, <laughs> and if you have this lady that came from the hospital, I mean, just everybody wants to know about the negative air pressure room. So if she wants to come on this format and talk about what she learned in hospitals um, could be applied to dentistry, it'd be an honor. Very cool, very cool. I'll, I will talk to them both uh, today and I can get back to you soon. Okay, so what are you gonna do now? Go have some uh, eggs and deer deer meat. Uh, I eat eggs and bacon. <laughs> you eat eggs and deer I'll tell you meat. what, with all of this, uh, we're all working from home and it's amazing how hard, I mean, there's so much to do. I thought, you know, working from home might be a little bit more relaxing. It is not, we are working our butts off and uh, I'm, I'm sure you're experiencing the same thing, but I got a full day ahead of me. I'm sure you do too, but I really enjoyed getting the opportunity to, to spend some time with you, Howard, and uh, you are my favorite dental legend, and it, it's been a great honor to be on your webinar. Well, well, you and I should start the Mutual Admiration Club. We'll just, we'll just, uh, there'll only be two of us. We'll just get together and admire each other because I've admired you greatly for 30 years. Thanks for all that you've done. And by the way, um, it's just one more thing. When, you're, when your dad gives that talk about how his entire business was destroyed by a hurricane and it was just game over. And, and when it was game over and he should have packed up his bags and gone home, he didn't. He reached in, he found something that most people can't find. And when he tells that story, there's not a dry eye in the house. Everyone in the room is crying. So uh, tell your dad, thanks for all he's great done. Man. He's a great man. I will let him know. And Thank the you, apple Howard. did not fall far from Great me. talking. All right. Have a great day.